today, the RBA is trapped. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Well, that is Post covering finance and property news. It's a Friday and Tarek has joined me. Hello, Tarek, how are you doing? Yeah, good, mate. It's good to be back. It's been a little while, so I'm I'm sure we'll have plenty to talk about. Oh, there's just so much, so much going on. And we're going to sort of focus a little bit on the RBA. Of course, the RBA was in Senate um, Economic Committee territory this last week, which uh, was quite interesting. And um, I have to say, um, as I watch some of the economic uh, data flowing through, I do think they are pretty much trapped. They are, aren't they? I mean, it's it's really it's really quite interesting to watch it all because I actually wrote an article a few weeks ago just asking, is the Australian economy about to hit a wall? And the recent evidence from the latest jobs numbers is, well, maybe, yeah. And I mean, it, no matter what metric you look at now, a lot of people have said there are issues with the seasonal seasonal adjustments and stuff like that. And, you know, that's that's fine. That may be a significant factor. But even when you look at the trend numbers, in terms of the things like, say, like quarterly out, you know, hours worked compared with a quarter earlier, they are down now as as much as they were at the depths, at the absolute worst of the 1990s recession. So Hours worked are falling off a cliff relative to you know previous cycles, but the interesting thing is, is so far we've we haven't seen that we haven't seen jobs being lost yet. We've seen the labor force fail to keep up, sorry, the labor market fail to keep up with labor force growth, but in net terms, people are not yet losing jobs. Well, it was interesting, and uh, as you say, the uh, the data was. Uh bit wobbly because they did the survey right over Christmas New Year. So, you know, it's, it's sort of, well, a lot of people were thinking, well, I'm off for a few weeks, but I might pick up again. And in fact, the last two or three years, you know, the January numbers have been all over the place. By the way, the previous one was all pretty all over the place too. So th there is an interesting question on the employment data, not just in Australia, but in the UK and elsewhere, as to whether in fact there's something weird about the way that, that the system works. Um, in the UK, they're doing a major review at the moment because what they're finding is they're not getting um, adequate good responses to the surveys. So they've actually warned that the, <laughs> the unemployment data is actually wobbly. <laughs> that, and that's from the official, you know, the equivalent of the ABS in, 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 in the UK. So I think that's interesting. But you're right. If, if you stand back and just think about it slightly more objectively, you can see that there's a, a bit of a twist in the way that uh, the employment and unemployment numbers are working. And I guess the other point there is that um, if it is true that we are not seeing the jobs growth, we know, I think it's what, 32,000 jobs need to be added each month just to stand still because of the high migration. And I think, you know, yeah. we, we, we added a handful of jobs this last month. So that really highlights the significant issue here. And because the other one is interesting, if you look at consumer confidence, um, there were two data sets. There was the Melbourne Institute Westpac one, which showed a very slight uptick from very, very low level to very low level. But the one from Roy Morgan, which came out pretty much on the same time, but actually was quite slightly after the RBA announcement had dropped a little and still in very negative territory, you know, in territory that you only saw recently through COVID. So, you know, you start looking at the data and you think, well, you know, there are some signs that things are not good. On the other hand, the inflation story is still stronger and, um, you know, goods inflation has come down thanks to the base effects, but that's beginning to reverse now. Shipping costs have, uh, have risen quite considerably, but the services inflation, which of course is linked to wages and, uh, and other things, is still hanging out there. Plus, of course, the insurance premiums have gone way through the roof and I think this is something which um, people haven't necessarily fully understood. You know, the costs of getting insurance cover for pretty much all categories are way higher in some cases, 20% higher or more. So I'm afraid the inflation story looks to me to be still relatively robust. The RBA saying probably won't back, be back in band until late 25, 2026, 20, something like that. So wh what do they do? Well, I mean, I think that's what's interesting. Like, 
historically the RBA is not someone who moves by themselves unless they have a great deal of scope to do so. Now, if you look at major rate cut cycles that the RBA have engaged in, say, let's call it like to say like the last 35 years, the RBA has only cut rates without the Fed firing the starting gun for them, either you know, through jawboning or by directly cutting rates on two occasions. Now, the, the, one, the one occasion is in at the start of 1990, which was, you know, the, the 1990s recession, and Australia's interest rates were something like 9% higher than the, than the US interest rates at the time because they had different inflationary battles going on. Then the other time the RBA moved unilaterally, the, the RBA cash rate was over 4% higher than the federal funds rate, and that was... Um, and that was just around the time of the financial crisis, just just prior, I should say. Actually, I'll have to I'll have to double check that one. I think I might be thinking of something else. But anyway, suffice to say, in previous cycles, they have the, the RBA has either waited or they have got scope on their own to act unilaterally without it risking importing inflation and without reigniting existing inflation. Now, I mean, obviously, you know, you look at 1990, unemployment went, went then went from 6% to 11%. So, you know, they were kind of, they were okay in that instance, but they don't have that scope this time. This time, the US federal funds rate is 1.15% above the RBA cash rate, which is very abnormal compared with the rest of history. So if they do cut rates, there is going to be a cost. There's going to be a cost in terms of downward pressure on the Australian dollar, and the potential for to import inflation. But then there's also the fact that the combination of the tax cuts and a combination of change consumer consumer confidence for sort of, shall we say, more affluent households who, who may be more willing to spend, that could see inflation, you know, in, in resurge, or at the very least, it could see inflation end up being made of just that little bit stickier. So that's it's a really it's a really tough one for the RBA. Yeah, and I suspect that uh, she will do nothing for quite some time. You know, uh, uh, effectively, just let let things run forward until there are stronger signs. And by the way, because you know, Pal said the same thing. Really, you know, well, we'll wait and see what the data is saying. And interestingly, in the UK, the um, the data here uh, also w was doing the same. So some of the data is a little bit stronger. Wages growth is quite strong. Um, uh, some of it a little weaker. The UK has also just gone into a, a technical recession. Um, you know, so all of those things are there. So I think central banks are actually um, probably uh, twiddling their thumbs for a few months. And I'm fascinated what the, the market, of course, was really aggressively pricing in rate cuts pretty much in all of these markets. Those have been kicked down the road. And uh, as a result of that, of course, bond yields are uh, uh, it's quite a lot stronger too. So, yeah, it's going to be really interesting. But meanwhile, of course, you make a very important point that not all households are in the same boat, you know, and I saw that in the CBA results and uh, some of the data that they shared, right? How interesting to see the proportion of mortgages that are interest only rising quite significantly. And I don't know whether you noticed this, but in the CBA fixed rate mortgages, they have sort of rejigged the way they've reported the numbers, kick, kick them down the road. Uh, so in fact, there, there's something weird gone on there too. Yeah, I don't. And I think that the strange thing about the CBA numbers were, I get that, that, that loans expiring in the future can shift and change as people refinance, as people move away, you know, maybe they end their loan early and, you know, take their business elsewhere in order to get a better rate or, you know, just refinance early and maybe, you know, negotiate something with the bank. But I think one of the interesting things was that I don't really understand how the number of previously expired fixed rate loans from several quarters ago or even several years ago changed. Yep. Now, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I honestly, I honestly don't. I don't, I don't know how that happened. You know, and, you know, this isn't just sort of like, you know, going too deep into the data tinfoil hat stuff. You know, there are some, you know, very prominent economists asking exactly the same question. How did this happen? Yeah. And, you know, possibly, possibly they've extended some of those fixed rate 
term loan further, right? Because there's there's a series of, well, you know, I've called it extend and pretend previously, right? Where, where you've got um, households who are up against it and the banks are leaning over backwards to try and actually not make them um, appear as a defaulting loan. So there has been quite a lot of restructuring of, of, of loans below the waterline. And I suspect what we're seeing here is a little bit of that. And like I said, you know, the, the proportion of interest only loans has gone up. So one of the solutions that banks are offering is to move people on to interest only for a period of time. Just remember three or four years ago, APRA said we're concerned about the proportion of loans that are actually interest only because there are higher risks involved. Well, guess what's been happening? More people have been um, sh uh, shunted off into uh, interest, only, uh, uh, interest only loans. So I think there are lots of very deep questions that, should be being asked. But of course, the banks are quite um, um, flexible in terms of the information they provide, but not necessarily providing the full story. Well, I mean, I think, you know, the, the, the issue in instances like this is that corporations or individuals or just, you know, any any being will, 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 you know, sort of follow the letter of what is required of them. You know, if 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 APRA says this is what is required, then that is what they will do to that particular letter. Yep. And part of the problem is that during COVID, APRA completely threw the rule book out the window and they changed so many different things to make, you know, bad loans seem good and, you know, wave the magic wand. You know, I mean, there were literally bank analysts were calling it extend and pretend. That is not just, you know, a, a, a meme that we've come up with. It's actually, you know, a literal name for policy. I mean, even even some Fed speakers used it. I'm I'm, I'm not sure whether it, whether it made it into the RBA vernacular, but you know that's right. Neither neither here nor there. But I just think it's interesting that we don't really know. You know, to what degree would we be looking at things like arrears and all these other things if we were using the same methodology as prior to COVID? or if we were using the same methodology as, say, 30 years ago. Because it's all well and good to say, oh, well, arrears in 1989 were X and arrears now are Y, but are we measuring things the same way? I seriously doubt it. You know, I don't... I mean, back then, the banks were a lot more likely to just, we're going to repossess that and we're going to sell that. Whereas these days, the banks are, you know, in relative terms to that, trying to be everyone's best friend. Yeah, well, the, the banks don't want to show an uptick in arrears, although, of course, the CBA results included an uptick in arrears. Um, not a dramatic one, but but quite significant. But, of course, then they say, well, it's still low historically. And if you go back, the trends. But as you say, they're measuring it, I think, rather rather differently here. So, the, I mean, there's there's a really big a big question here as to what is the, the true state of play. And again, you know, my surveys say, well, there are some households doing absolutely fine and uh, they've got mortgages and they're paying. And in fact, they're paying off more quickly. Uh, the, you know, the, the prepayments um, are actually there. And of course, because of the offset accounts now um, high, with higher interest rates, it means you actually get a better benefit by paying, paying off more, more quick. So that's definitely happening. So that's definitely in, in, in one part of the uh, mortgage book. But there's another part of the mortgage book where there's a lot of, of difficulty and a lot of people really struggling. And, and in many cases, they are actually, you know, having to talk to the bank and and whilst the, the the hardship category hasn't bloomed dramatically, it's the restructuring and it's the the tweaking of of, of the loan book um, down at the individual loan level to help people, which I think is the, is the interesting question. And nobody really knows. And by the way, I would make the point: the RBA, of course, claims to have uh, their finger on the pulse here, but their major data set is a securitized mortgage pool. And that data set is not typical of all mortgages in the Australian market, right? They're sort of hand-selected. So whilst the RBA can claim one set of stories about, well, you know, there's only a relatively small proportion, blah, 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 you know, and, and there are some people uh, in difficulty, others are fine. Um, I'm a little bit sceptical as to whether the RBA data set is actually um, truly reflective of what's going on down on the ground. Well, just speaking of RBA data sets, and just to take a look, to go off on a little bit of a tangent in the moment, because you know we never do that. Um, <laughs> I think it's interesting that uh, the RBA was asked by the House Economics Committee about the Bank of Mum and Dad, and yes. they were just like, I don't know, 
we don't know. We don't have we don't have data on that. And it's like I just think that's really fascinating because you know recently Shane Oliver was interviewed by Domain and he said that that the bank of mum and dad was an absolutely huge driver of purchases of pe for for people in the last 12 months, in particular because of the rental crisis. So it's been a major driver of housing demand, ha uh, I mean, and also of outcomes within the housing market. You know, c considering that we have seen rising prices, it's entirely possible that the wealth effect, you know, something that the RBA has studied extensively, is contributing to inflation. Yet they haven't adequately investigated this avenue that could be driving inflation. And that's just... That's just a you know just raises a few questions to me. But I did I actually had a, had a question for you after reading this this recent study in the UK. Mm. It said that forty seven percent of all home purchases under the age of fifty five had some form of family or friend assistance in purchasing a property. You know, so this isn't just first home buyers. This includes people who are moving up to their second and third, you know, homes. You know, you know later later on in their lives. So. My question to you is, have you ever, you know, investigated that in, in your in your data that, you know, for, for people who are purchasing, you know, not their first home, but, you know, up trading and stuff like that, that ha has there been people in Australia looking for that sort of assistance from family at that time as well as first home buyers? The short answer is absolutely. Yes, um, I have data on that. And uh, it's, it's um, been up and down over the years, but it's much higher now than it was. So, um, you know, th there are people who are in homes that are too small for them, you know, that their family's growing and, you know, they just haven't got enough space. So they're desperate to, to uptrade. And uh, there's about 800,000 <clears throat> um, uptraders relatively active, either wanting to or, or in the process of. And about a quarter of them, so let's say 200,000 over the last 12 months, a quarter of them actually got help from um, other family members to be able to actually do that as part of the transaction. Now, in some cases, it wasn't a massive amount. It might have been covering stamp duty. Um, it might have been, in some cases, injecting a little bit of um, um, support in terms of things like moving and other things. But in some cases, the amount of money that it's actually transferring is actually you know significant. And I'm talking in some cases, across the spectrum, um, we're talking you know, $300,000, $400,000 as part of the contribution to allow somebody to actually move up. So basically, the and I spoke to a couple of people, I'm sure they won't mind me mentioning this, uh, who are in that situation, where, it's where basically the difference of the additional mortgage that was required came from the bank of mum and dad. So their mo monthly mortgage repayments didn't change, but they were actually able to buy a bigger property with the help of, of, of the bank of mum and dad, right? So that seems to be a thing at the moment. And like I say, it's quite a big number. No, that's that's really interesting because it's something I've wondered about for a long, long time because, you know, it really just, it just it's just concerning because it, it sort of, you know, is creating this sort of world now where if you do want to buy a home or uptrade or basically just, you know, behave like this as a normal property market, you you know a lot of people are increasingly needing that level of assistance. I mean, if you could send me that data, I'd love to. I'd love to take take a look. You know, when you when you have time, that would be fantastic. Sure. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll I'll pull I'll pull some data. I make one other point that sometimes the um, you know kid is up trading is part of a transaction where the parents are down trading, right? Because quite a lot of people who are you know in that sort of more affluent and I own the property, little mortgage, no mortgage, are wanting to move into somewhere smaller. And quite often what I'm seeing, and I've got some data on this as well, that, that when down traders are actually considering moving, and that's quite, there's a bigger pool of down traders and up traders, by the way, um, one of the drivers, again, is to help the kiddies. So I've got some data on that. I'll, I'll look that out over the next little while and, and, and chuck you some info because I think it's this is a really critical part of the dynamic. And I'm shocked. I mean, I was shocked when I heard the RBA say, well, we don't even think about the bank of mum and dad. I mean, that, that was an astonishing um, comment. Um, and I, I, by the way, I will make this other point too. From my research, quite a few of the banks don't ask hard questions about where the cash came from um, you know, uh, if you're actually 
applying for for a loan and you know that there are know your customer requirements of course but quite often what i'm finding is that um uh, those um you know seagull payments that actually come into the transaction are just uh, gobbled up by the banks and saying whoopee well we can we can lend so i don't think there's a huge amount of due diligence being done and just remember this um those first time buyers who buy with the bank of mum and dad are about three times more likely to default in the subsequent five years than normal so that there's a uh, this is a huge issue and it's part of this wealth transference and uh, again i feel the rba is um just haven't got the finger on the pulse do they do they care maybe they should i think that i'm not sure they do well i mean if i if i recall correctly and you know correct me if i'm wrong but you know i think i think that basically bullock's position uh you know when she sort of clarified the R- the rba's view is basically we do not think that this is a huge big deal for financial stability yeah you know so i mean i understand from that perspective you know, because as far as the as far as the RBA is concerned, to 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 just quote what you just said, you know, the banks are like, "We'll pay. We're getting a whole. We're getting money thrown at us. We don't really care where it's coming from. That's fantastic." But from the position of the setter of monetary policy, it's incredibly relevant. Yeah. And if it not only that, but considering you know what you've just said that you know up you know up to a quarter of people who are up trading. I get it using the bank of mum and dad. I mean, damn, at that point, you know, you're talking about like, you know, you put together the fact that, you know, what, what what's the current numbers on your um, bank of mum and dad for, for recently? What is it about 40 odd percent at the moment? Yeah, it's slightly higher now because it's, it's, go- it's going up again and the average contribution is well over $100,000. Well, exactly. There you go. So you're talking about roughly half of first home buyer transactions yeah. and then 25% of, of up traders. I mean, that, you know that in and of itself is a sizable proportion of the entire property market, at least it the owner occupier property market. It is, and yep. if that that that's an, an enormous driver of of, in, of inflation and of monetary policy outcomes. But well, I mean, I don't know. Well, the point you know, they is say it... they say if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. So I'm going to pull <laughs> that one right there. But the, just one observation: inflation in Australia is not reported to include home prices. So, so by definition, the RBA would say it doesn't matter because, I mean, there's, there's a rental flow through, et cetera, et cetera, but it doesn't actually matter with regard to monetary policy. And that's the prop. I think that, that for me is a fundamental problem. And, you know, if you think of the proportion of um, inflation in Australia that's actually connected to, to housing directly or indirectly and compare it with the way inflation is calculated in the US and, and elsewhere, it's quite different. So we, we sort of insulated ourselves from some of these dynamics from an RBA perspective, and maybe that's the reason why they don't think it's that critical. That's, that's a good point. I mean, I think the thing is that a lot, I mean, I think the thing is like looking at things from a headline perspective, it's easy to say, well, inflation is inflation. US inflation, Aussie inflation, UK inflation, they're all the same. But they're not. They're actually deeply, deeply, deeply differently measured. You know, in the US, housing related inflation. So let's just, you know, break it down to owners equivalent rent and which is basically, you know, they ask owners of homes what their what their home would be rented for if they were to be renting and if not and not owning. Then there's actually obviously ad, actual rent paid. That those two components by themselves are over 30% of the US entire US CPI. Whereas in Australia, rents Rents make up roughly the same amount as alcohol. Yeah, I think it's about it's about you know nine yep. percent. Is it nine percent? I'm I'm not with it today. I'm I'll, I'll blame that I'll, I'll blame that on you know, having a newborn sleep deprivation. No, but, that's fine. But, but know, it's, a, it's a smaller proportion. It's absolutely it's just yeah. a smaller proportion. Actually, no, it's about six percent, isn't it? From memory, yeah. now that I think yeah. about it, it's like five point seven five. Yeah, yeah, five. That's it. Five point five. It. Yeah, it's about five point seven five. Yeah, so. You're talking about a fairly small number, yep. you know, and then there's obviously new home prices, which are about eight or nine, but it's still well, well down from the US number. So yeah, uh, it's by, very, very different. And by the way, travel, international travel and what have you, and, you know, and all those things is a high proportion in the Australian CPI calculation as well. 
So because because of the other stuff that's excluded, it by definition, and they the ABS recently um, upstated those as a proportion of the total more. So yeah, so even the way we measure and rents dropped. <laughs> exactly, yeah, exactly right. So uh, you know, you, you'd sort of have to say the gap between real lived experience of a lot of people, you know, in terms of what they're actually seeing in terms of real inflation versus uh, what the numbers say are chalk and cheese. And then, of course, you've got the ACCC coming in over the top and saying, well, of course, a lot of corporates in a lot of sectors are gouging. And um, uh, the XACCC, I should say, because, of course, uh, Alan Fales did it for the unions. But uh, that report was pretty shocking as well, which basically what said what we always felt, that the inflation numbers in Australia are higher, again, because of poor corporate behaviour. Well, it's... Yeah. It's a bit of a myth. We should probably get to the. We should probably get into the charts. We're about yeah. we're about half an hour in already. <laughs> no, no, no. You're right. Let's let's go there. <laughs> no. Okay, as usual, folks. The charts will be available at avacom.substack.com. Um, I just like to say thanks to all the new subscribers and for people for their messages of support. That has been very much appreciated. I'm also adding a new service. If you would like for me to investigate something and write a report on it at an institutional or organizational level, just DM me on Twitter, just get into contact with me, and we'll see if we can work something out or not. And without, fur without further delay, we shall get into the slides. Okay, now, the Fed and the RBA... This, I think, illustrates why the RBA is the one who is trapped. The, they are seeing a relatively strong rise in unemployment where the US is, well, frankly, not. And the problem for the RBA compared with the US is that our, pop, our labor force is growing about almost five times faster than theirs in, by, some, by some metrics. So that's really... a, a Sorry, our working age population, my bad. And basically, that is really, you know, a sizable problem for us. So it's not it's not keeping up. And basically, the worst things, actually, I'll just double, where is it? There it is. Next slide, this one. Basically, what's happening is the number of jobs being created in net terms is falling. We've seen it drop from about 44,000 in March of last year to 7,400 in January. And as Martin mentioned previously, we need 32,000 jobs just to stand still. The risk here is twofold. A, there's the, there's the risk that basically things just flatline from here, that we just have roughly similar jobs growth to November, December, January for the next, let's, let's call it next 12 months. Under that sort of circumstances, unemployment is going to rise significantly and we're probably going to end the year close to about 5% 5, 5 unemployment, assuming people don't leave the workforce. But the really, the, 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 perhaps the, the more concerning risk is that jobs growth turns negative, that jobs start to be lost in net terms. So... Not only do you have the 32,000 people that you're adding to the labor force every month who need a job, you all you then also have the people who are going to be losing jobs in net terms, then going out and looking for work. And that could see the unemployment rate spike to really, really concerning levels. You know, if that scenario were to come to pass, and hopefully it doesn't, you know, things like five, five and a half, six percent unemployment are on the table, unfortunately. Yeah, and the RBA was forecasting, what, 4.3% by 2025. So they're not expecting a significant rise in unemployment. No, well, I think the thing that's interesting with the RBA is that they, they, they revised their unemployment forecasts up for a start, and they said 4.2% mid-year, and it's already 4.1%. Yep. And if not for the fall in the participation rate over the last few months, it had already be 4.5% in the seasonally adjusted terms. Now, I think the seasonal adjusted numbers are messy. You know, uh, they're not perfect. That's why I, trend, I try to focus on the trend numbers. But, yeah, it's not a, it's not a pretty picture. 
No, I agree. And um, I think the unemployment rate is likely to go a lot higher. But if inflation stays high too, they are trapped, right? Well, it, exactly. Now, I'm just going to go back to this previous chart. Now, this this is a trend unemployment. Now, this is where I, I, genu- I generally place my focus because the seasonally adjusted numbers can be very, very noisy mm. and very, very much up and down, whereas this sort of smooths out a lot of those issues, particularly after revisions. But even though the trend participation rate has only fallen by about 0.2%, it has actually already significantly cushioned the blow of rising unemployment from those people leaving the labor force. If participation rate had have remained the same, we would be looking at already 4.2% unemployment in trend terms, and we would already be at the RBA's mid-year target. So it's, it's really that there is really a risk here that things can deteriorate quite rapidly. And to be completely honest with you, looking at some of the forecasts, I don't think that that risk is really being adequately priced in, shall we say. Priced in by the markets or priced in by the RBA? Priced in by the RBA, but even even just the broader, the broader you know, sort of, consensus for for where the forecasts of, of, of where the labor market is going like i mean there are admittedly there are several who who believe it's going to go significantly higher than what the rba believes it will mm. but i think that there needs to be a greater discussion that there is a risk that things could re- deteriorate really quite rapidly here because the hours worked metric is absolutely blaring alarm bells but we've been very very lucky so far that this cycle has been different to every other cycle before. If you compare this with any other cy- any any of the other cycles that we have data for, unemployment would have risen by one, one and a half or two percent by now, by the time you get to this point. Because, you know, that's just the way that that, it, that the labor market normally has functioned historically. And, and we're talking about as as sort of and we're not talking about like, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago either. I mean, we're talking about some numbers that are as you know, sort of recent as the global financial crisis. So the, the economy hasn't, and attitudes haven't changed that much, but the difference, the, the difference where things have changed is the desire of employers to hold on to labor yeah. because of the way that, because of the way what happened with the fight, uh, with, with the pandemic, with people struggling to get a hold of the skilled labor, the labor that they needed. And now they've got too much, but they're thinking, well, we'll, we'll try and hold on to it for as long as we can. And the risk is that basically a lot of businesses all decide at the same time that as they see the economy sort of not doing so great, that they finally just go, well, we're going to have to cut, you know, we're going to have to cut jobs. We're going to have to cut a few people here and there because the demand just isn't there anymore. So that, yeah, I think is a real risk that if we do start to see those job cuts at a time when you're already seeing an unemployment rise just because the labor force is growing so quickly, then things could get really, really ugly. And that's that's a really challenging scenario, particularly for the RBA, because they're going to have to deal with it if that, if it comes to pass. Yeah. And, of course, migration is still very high. The latest figures were still booming. Yeah. I, I mean, it was hoped that that, the, that it would be, that we would have seen the peak in, you know, Q2 2023, which is the latest hard data we have on migration and population. But... You know, I mean, Shane Oliver put out a good a good tweet yesterday, I believe it was, yep. and he said that it, you know he concluded that based on long term arrivals numbers, that it's entirely possible that migration hasn't peaked yet. Yep. He didn't say that with with any degree, you know, of certainty, but he said yes, it's 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 possible, and that is really that's that's quite concerning for several reasons because it means that we could see labour force growth revised up, which could potentially see unemployment revised up. And it's also the fact that that also means that the housing deficit that we have could be larger than than, it, than anticipated, and that could put further upward pressure on inflation through rents and make an already challenging rental crisis even more unpleasant. Yeah, and the RBA primarily, of course, has these two objectives, right? Employment, inflation, inflation, employment. So what happens if the if the two are pulling in two different directions? Um, so, you know, on one hand, they want to put it rates up. On the other hand, they need to put rates down. They're stuck. I think they, I think eventually they have to, they'll, 
that they, they'll they'll start the labor market in my opinion eventually. Yeah. You know, I think that if inflation was you know sort of five percent, they'd be really really stuck. But if inflation has a three in front of it, even if it's three point eight, three point nine, I think they'll I think they'll cut. If 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 the labor market really starts to really starts to go downhill rapidly, I don't think they ha- I don't think they're really going to have. I don't think they're really going to have much of a choice because, I mean, you, you look at what's happening now, you know, you, you're seeing, you know, politicians get it, getting all up in the RBA's business because of the cost of mortgages. I can only imagine what it would be like if, say, hypothetically, we were we were sitting here in, say, let's say July or August and unemployment's 4.8% and pushing 5 they <laughs> That's not going to be that's not going to be a fun time for Michelle Bullock in front of the in front of the 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 House Economic Committee if that comes to pass. I tell you what, I, I'd uh, I'll, I'll pay tickets to watch that. That'll be quite interesting. <laughs> you might just get your wish, mate. You <laughs> might. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now this is what I was talking about regarding the issue with trend hours worked. Now, I use the trend metric because the seasonally adjusted ones can be very, very noisy. And it's also worth noting that compared with December, the the hours worked has been revised down significantly for about the last six months worth of data. And I think this is this is notable uh, for, for, a, for an important reason because people have suggested that some of the weak, the labor market weakness that has been seen recently is down to seasonality. And it's entirely possible, you know, given the issues that have the, that the ABS has had with seasonality on this and other metrics in the last couple of years. Sure, it's well and truly possible. But I think what makes this interesting is even if you go back to October, before the seasonal issues start to emerge in November and December and January, the numbers then were already very, very, you know, very, very bad. You know, like, like sort of depths of the financial crisis bad. So, I think that, I think that at the end of the day, the that the labor demand for labor is deteriorating. The question now is to what degree that's going to push up unemployment, and how long can employers hold off on letting people go? And honestly, that's a that's a that's a question more I think of human psychology at this point than it is of you know sort of more normal economics yeah i agree about the psychology it's interesting in the uk the um story here has also been uh you know that um quite a few businesses held on to people held on to people held on to people hoping that things would turn around but now um you know two quarters of, of negative and um by the way five quarters of a drop gdp per capita in the uk um now a lot of um, uh, businesses are saying, "Well, we can't actually hope for any longer. You know, we actually need to take decisions now." So there's an expectation that things are going to actually continue to drift lower rather than, than not. So there is a tipping point, and I'm not sure where that tipping point is in Australia, but we could be quite close to it. Yeah, I, I think that we're we're in sort of a bit of a strange sort of bit of a twilight zone sort of thing, really. Because on one hand, you've got a bunch of people, you know, FOMOing into the housing market in places like Sydney and Melbourne. You know, you've seen that in, you know, the, the, the relatively strong auction clearance numbers so far, although listings are up too. And that's something that we'll get to later in the later in the show. But on the other hand, you do have these issues with the labor market. You do have all these indicators that are pointing to concerning times ahead. And, you know, I feel like they're on a bit of a collision course in that regard. Yeah. You know, you even look at, say, for example, the the NAB business surveys. You know, that's not that's not healthy either. So, you know, and there's obviously the Judo Bank PMIs, and they haven't been they haven't been especially robust in a long time now. So, it's it's really just interesting to see where that, like, as you said, that psychological tipping point is going to be because there are things pulling in different directions, and there's also just this narrative of, oh, well, the tax cuts are coming and that's going to solve everything, you know, and people are going to be able to borrow nine hundred trillion dollars more and everything's going to be great. So, yeah, it's it's going to be interesting to see sort of what th- where things sit once sort of you know reality sets in in that regard. I agree. Well, we'll we'll be back to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we certainly will. 
Okay. Where do I start with this one? <laughs> okay. Um. Basically, I was I got I got curious about what growth looked like during the great during the era of the Great Depression. So I found a Treasury paper that covered it, which was actually quite was was actually quite interesting. I'll I'll put a link into it to to it in the Substack uh, article with all the charts. But what was interesting is that the average level of growth for in for GDP per capita over the last decade in Australia has been 0.93%. For the 1930s as a whole, which is admittedly spread out over an entire decade, it was 1.2%. So I don't know how, but we found a way for growth to be worse than a decade that encompassed the Great Depression. Now, people can say, well, what about uh, the impact of COVID. Okay. What I did is I I then also did compounded annualized growth rate. And that came in at 0.9%, which is actually slightly worse. So yeah, I just I just think it's really just quite amazing at how badly the government and policymakers have managed to run the economy. Particularly given that the last decade also encompasses the explosion in LNG in in um, LNG revenue and GDP derived from gas exports, and in in that in that past decade, we basically went from importing bugger oil, exporting bugger oil LNG, to at some points being the largest exporter of LNG in the world. Yeah, and I guess the other interesting question there, Tarek, is um, you know, is the fundamental problem productivity? Because you know there were productivity improvements in in the in the earlier decades, but productivity now is it was, going the wrong way isn't it and dramatically so yeah, i mean absolutely you know productivity underpins wages growth productivity underpins economic growth yeah and there isn't really a plan to fix productivity and nor is it really in a lot of ways a priority because what because i think the thing is you know in a more normal nation or even in a more normal era of our own nation people would go out they would invest in private enterprise they would build up their businesses. They would expand those businesses. They would innovate. They would do all these different things. And the tools and the incentives were there to do that. Today, the incentives are to go buy a bunch of properties and then and, and then get all the tax incentives and then buy some more properties and buy some more properties. And that is sort of, you know, the dream for some people, you know, to 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 be able to, you know, rent seek their way to a comfortable life. And, you know, that I mean, to to once again go back to what we were discussing before, when that is what the incentives and the settings of the system are, it's not really surprising that people react in a logical and rational way to those settings. Yep. And just to be clear, the growth in the housing sector and the growth in you know the mortgage negative gearing etc cetera, etc cetera, none of that is productive it's actually unproductive and i sometimes say it's like a big black hole it's sucking more and more of the economy down the toilet essentially because it's less and less able then to invest in other things and that's the root cause problem. So in a way, this is another manifestation, in my view, of 20 to 30 years of failed policy relating specifically to, to, to housing. No wonder we don't get as much investment um, as, as we did, and no wonder we get less productivity. It, it's part of the same housing complex that is actually the, the cornerstone of everything and yet the cornerstone of nothing. Well, I think one of the interesting things is is that you just if you compare historical mortgage burdens and historical deposit burdens, I think that 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 paints a really interesting picture because historically, you know, say for example, the median age, you know, members of Gen Y, they would all be homeowners by now. You know, like not all, but like a greater proportion would be homeowners by now. You know, because they would have been buying houses in their their late their late twenties and their very early thirties. Yep. Whereas now, you know, your data and other data shows that that it's more likely their their mid to late thirties, yep. and in some cases, 
you know, some some data that I've seen from overseas suggests it's it's very nearly in some cases closer to 40 than it is to 35. So you've got these people who are saving and saving and saving and saving for so long, you know, you know, some of these people who perhaps don't have access to the bump bank of mum and dad, or even if they do, it's not enough. And what does that do to consumption? Historically, these people would have been buying houses, you know, five, seven, eight years earlier, paying off those houses, enjoying strong nominal wages growth, and being more generally much more affluent, much more free spending consumers. And they'd be out there, you know, spending at local businesses, or they'd be creating a business of their own because they they feel secure and they have that additional capital that maybe, you know, the mortgage as a as a proportion of their income has come down, you know. So they have that opportunity to then, you know, pursue a productive enterprise or pursue volunteer work or to pursue whatever it is that they choose to do with their life. But the way things are now, it doesn't work like that anymore. You know, people are stuck saving for longer. They're stuck paying down debts for longer. You're seeing more and more people retire with debt. You know, more and more people having to work into their old age, not by choice, but by, you know, by circumstance. And I mean, I was even saying the other day, you're seeing the impact of this at everything down to the local, the local Salvos or Vinnie's op shop, because there isn't the number of older volunteers now who are mortgage free who can dedicate two or three days a week to going to going and help helping out a charitable organization you know because they're too busy working or they're too busy taking care of their their grandkids full time because because you know the 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 grand because they, their children are working their ass off to pay the mortgage yeah absolutely well you know the debt to income multiples much higher than they were the average duration of a mortgage much longer than it was. The average size of the mortgage, of course, a lot bigger because property prices have gone through the roof. Um, <clears throat> all of those things are sucking the air out of the rest of the economy. And that's simply that. It is, exactly. I mean, and if people are spending the cash on their mortgage or they're spending the cash on saving for a deposit, of course that's going to happen. I mean, I think it's really, 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 really funny because, you know, you get the sort of you know, for want of a better expression, the boomer meme, you know, of, you know, the sort of caricature of a boomer who says to young people, you just need to spend less, spend less and spend less and spend less, and then you can be able to afford a deposit and buy a house. And I, I, and I would say to that, that, that caricature of a person, do you really, really, really want that? Because a, a small proportion of people like myself who live very, very frugally, do do that. And you do not want my intended entire generation to do that, who people who want to buy houses, because the entire economy would face plant tomorrow. You know, and I don't think that there's that realization of that's the way the economy works, not just shut your trap and, and deal with it because that's the hand you've been dealt. No, good point. And of course, the um, <clears throat> demographic shifts mean that there are more and more people in that in that in that bucket. And over time, there'll be less and less people who, because they'll be falling off the perch at the, you know, the upper end, right? So this distortion is going to get more extreme rather than less extreme. Indeed. And just on that particular topic, I think one of the interesting things that, that is sort of somewhat overlooked is that basically as households age, they become less and less likely to move. So... You know, basically people, you know, they get into their forever home and they stay there, which, you know, live in the dream. But at a societal level, we're seeing that impact housing turnover, which is driving housing turnover down. And it's also keeping a lot of what is the most desirable housing stock in the hands of people who don't need houses that that large anymore. Now, I have zero, I have I have zero problem with that because in in you know, from a in principle perspective, because people people pay for those houses, they worked hard. That's fine, but government policy needs to reflect that. Immigration policy needs to reflect that. Housing policy needs to reflect that. If all that housing stock is going to be locked away for the next twenty or thirty years, then we need to find a way to build more desirable housing for those families who need the homes that are that size. So. I just think that that's something that really just needs to be needs to be considered, and that's not really something that I've ever really seen talked about to or to any real significant degree. 
Good point. And of course, there is also the um, the downsizer 300K flip into superannuation, right? Which is the other thing that's uh, started to take off quite significantly. So there are people who are looking to downtrade. But part of the problem with the downtraders is that they look for an alternative property, can't find one. And if they do actually downtrade, they've still got to pay the stamp duty to actually to actually move. And so you suddenly start to see the barriers beginning to build. Uh, and so in a way that um, that superannuation, um, you know, just stick it over there in superannuation and it's tax-free uh, returns later, um, you know, is not necessarily having the effect, I think, that was intended either. So uh, this is, I mean, this huge intergenerational demographic issues. And again, it's been created by 30 years of bad policy. Yeah, pretty much. I mean... And I don't, I don't think that there's really any any sort of plan or answers to that from the politicians either. It's just very much, let's just keep going on the status quo, steady as she goes, and, you know, that iceberg will just get out of the way. Well, just, um, you know, throw out some more first owner grants and we can politically say we've, we've helped some more people to get into the property market and, um, no, it doesn't solve anything. Yeah, um, I, I, I was reading a speech from... Albo from just prior to the election and he was saying you know about the importance of home ownership and getting you know how aspiration to own a home is so important and it's so australian and blah 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 and i'm just like mate you have done so much damage to that particular aspiration in your time in government buddy yeah you know like and oh, but, and then you know people say oh well they, he's going to have ten thousand places in shared equity schemes every year and it's like cool more demand for housing that'll help yes yes I I think he probably holds some sort of an award for the um, most significant damage done in a shorter period of time <laughs> relating to housing yeah I mean I think that the I think that the liberals and and the the and APRA probably give them a bit of a run for their money for a twenty nine. I think that that is. I'm not sure actually. I mean, if we look at it, I guess it just really depends. If you look at sort of April May twenty nineteen through to December twenty nineteen, I think we could say the Liberals did a pretty good job as well. So hmm. I don't know. Maybe we'll have to we'll have to form a committee or we'll have to do something oh, well, and figure share, out exactly share the share the awards. You know, there's plenty of awards to go around after all. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, like those guys at, at the at the Olympics, or you know, who shared the the high jump gold medal. I'm sure we can yeah. we can get a gold yeah, medal. Yeah, for yeah, both absolutely. Of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really have that much commentary on this chart. It pretty much just speaks for itself. If it yeah. feels like it's harder to buy a property than it was 25 years ago, it's because yeah. it, is it is a lot harder to buy a property. Yeah, and uh, the real disposable trend. You know, is continuing to um, drop. <laughs> yeah, and I mean the t the tax cuts will help to a degree, but yeah, honestly, it's it's not a it's, it's not a pretty picture. Oh, and just on the tax cuts, a... did did you hear um, Michelle Bullock being queried about the um, stage three rejig? And yes, basically, she said, "Well." At an aggregate level, it makes no difference because it's the same amount of money. It's just being redistributed. So we didn't look at the redistribution of the impact. Um, although, interestingly, Treasury quoted the RBA as saying that actually there was you know, positive distributional impact, but she actually denied having any analysis of any distributional impact. There was a wonderful, wonderful mess. I miss Laura. <laughs> <laughs> It's sad to say, but but so true. <laughs> uh, no, yeah, I, I mean, didn't the RBA? I, I think it was David Taylor from the ABC who tweeted that the RBA did, you know, did some work for the, did some, you know, modelling and stuff like that on the stage three tax cuts, and that she said that she assumed that Chalmers would share the findings. I'm guessing the fact that she assumed means that he didn't, which I think is quite interesting. Yes. Yeah. Well, but no. she she denied in the um this is actually in the Senate, so this was this was um just you know a day or so ago, that they'd actually done any distribution analysis. Interestingly. How can they not? Is my question. I mean, <laughs> I Jesus Christ. I mean, like, you know, 
<laughs> there are literal RBA papers on how the distributional impact of the same amount of money can be so incredibly different across. I mean, there's, I mean, I can probably think of at least a dozen papers across yep. various central banks off the top of my head. Yep. And it's just like, how can you, although they don't have data on the bank of mom and dad, and that's worth how many billions. So, I mean, what, what do we know? Huh? Nin ninth biggest lender or 10th biggest lender, the bank of mom and dad. Oh, well, yeah. good old RBA. I'm glad that they're actually um, so effective in what they're doing. It would you know, be scary if they weren't effective, eh? Well, I mean, house price number go up. I mean, what, what more do you want? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, on to the listing numbers. Now, just to clarify, the numbers that are astronomical, like 182.3% up, uh, they're month-on-month -month numbers and totally normal because of the basic, well hibernation of yep. the real estate sector during the, during December and over Christmas. The numbers that are most relevant are the ones in the white bold, which are the year on year numbers. And as you can see from, this is, this is for new listings and Melbourne had its busiest new listings for January since 2008 and Sydney since 2011. So there is that demand there for property that what we've seen from some of the the data from say from PEXA on the number of mortgages being written and also just from the auction clearance rates from say for example from SQM but it also shows that there's quite a bit of property coming to market and I'm curious Martin do you have any theories as to why this is occurring now yep so a lot of those properties are actually ex investment properties uh particularly I've been looking at Melbourne very recently uh, the Net returns, so in other words, the cash flow returns in Melbourne have got more and more negative because the costs of the investment mortgages are continuing to rise. There's only a limit on on what you can do in terms of actually putting up the rent because people just can't afford to you know pay up a more rent. So there are a lot of property investors who've got old properties, um, need quite a lot of work done on them. Um, there are higher standards now coming in in terms of um, things like, um, uh, you know, alarms and those sorts of things. So there, there's a there's a real exit of property from the investment sector, and that people are thinking, well, you know, this is a good opportunity to capitalise on some of the value that we actually um, created over the last little while and get out. So that's the main. That's one of the main reasons that I'm seeing it. And interestingly, quite a few of those are houses rather than units. So I think that's a really important part of the story here. So there's definitely a you know a, a, a bit of a rise in listings. Although actually, absolutely, if you compare listings with um, a couple of years ago, they're still quite a lot lower. So it's still relatively. Yeah. Early. Yeah. I'll just get to that in the next chart. I mean. Yep. I think the thing is that. To give this a little bit of context, obviously, l new listings are up and new listings in some places are actually very strong, you, you know, historically strong as they are in Sydney and Melbourne. However, the, the total listing numbers are still overall quite depressed, but they are rising in Sydney and Melbourne. But the difference, the big, the big difference in this instance is that Perth, Adelaide and Brisbane are still seeing total listings fall year on year, which is part of the reason why those markets are performing so well. And Sydney and Melbourne have seen a relative degree of stagnation in terms of prices in recent months. Yeah, Melbourne's worse than Sydney. So I think Melbourne is leading the charge down. I think uh, if you look at the last data from CoreLogic, you know, they were below, below um, growth. In other words, they were actually losing value. Sydney, a little bit. But again, you've got to look at different locations. I don't know whether you saw some of the recent CoreLogic geographic analysis. I, I made a show on this the other day that showed that actually, if you look at it on a, on a suburb level, there are significant falls, actually very significant falls across the bulk of Melbourne with a few um, on the upside. In Sydney, it's a bit more mixed. But again, these aggregate averages of where prices are going just completely miss the differences in different locations and different types of property. And that's the critical issue of, of you know, what's what's really driving it. There are areas where prices are still quite strong, particularly in some of those 
inner city areas in Sydney, but in Melbourne, in some of the outer suburban areas, the price falls are significant now and uh, will continue, I think, because, uh, you know, the more listings coming on, supply, demand, well, demand is a bit weak. You know, you'll ha- I'll have to get you to send me the link to that core logic analysis. It sounds like something that's well worth reading. read. I, th- I missed that one. Yeah, I'll send you the – it's actually a site. I'll send you the link to, <clears throat> to the site. You can actually go in and literally you can query um, – Oh, that, of, that one. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So I, I pulled the information off that because that, that actually gives you the three month and 12 months. It gives you – by the way, it also shows <laughs> – I did the same thing for the ma- the rental maps as well. Um, and there, you know, the rental increase in Melbourne is up 20% in a lot of different areas over the last 12 months. So it also maps that too. Oh, it's fascinating. I'll have to take a look. Yep. Okay. Now, this is our last chart for the day, which has been hilariously mislabeled with last week's thing because I probably forgot to change it. Um <laughs> This basically details the share of Chinese steel consumption by industry. Now, if you notice that the share of steel consumed by the property sector has declined from forty percent to thirty three to thirty three percent over the last four over the last four years. So, I think one of the things that's interesting, though, is I would take that with a pinch of salt. Because what the Chinese government has done is that they have replaced the, 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 the steel demand that would have gone into property with steel demand that's gone into infrastructure. Yep. So you can see that in the chart that it's gone from property and infrastructure having a combined share of steel consumption at 60%, yet in 2023, it's 58%. So it's only moved very, very, very marginally in reality, whereas the broader chart makes it seem like the property sector is sort of, you know, falling off a bit of a cliff. And well, in fairness, it is, but that has been counteracted by them spending significantly more on infrastructure and basically that that picking up the shortfall. And that is one of the big things that has helped iron ore prices stay elevated. And well... The federal government's bottom line as well. Yeah, and just to be uh, very clear, you know, everyone was saying, "Well, we'll see um, iron ore prices fall," we'll see, but they're not. You know, they're actually pretty strong at the moment, right? And uh, it's because it's been redirected, and uh, it's clear to me that that's part of the, um, the the Chinese strategy is to direct investment elsewhere. Um, they're not going to necessarily. Um, be able to um, you know revive the property sector directly but they can find um, some proxies to uh, to help the economy by the way also I think there's a, there's a couple of years of um, partly completed property still to be completed and I, I was looking at some data the other day that said it's probably 2025 before we actually see the uh, the real fallout so there's a bit of lead time there but as you say it's um positive news for the Australian government insofar that it means that uh, the the um, flows uh, to China will generate revenue back to Australia. So that'll be another reason why the economy may avoid a recession. Yeah, I, it's, it's interesting. Like, so far, property activity in terms of starts is down about 14, 14 to 16%, depending on who you ask and the metric in question, whereas property sales both by you know square footage and by nominal sales are down somewhere between 55 and 60 and and 63 percent yep so realistically we are at best maybe a a quarter mate let's call it you know to be very you know ambitious and hopeful we're maybe a third of the way through the adjustment and i think the thing is that it's possible you know we saw this huge huge influx in the number of bonds and the value of bonds being issued by a Chinese local government in the, in the last 18 months in particular. And that has helped pay for all that additional infrastructure that has, you know, supported steel demand and by extension, iron ore and coking coal demand. But I just wonder, are they going to, how much longer are they going to be able to do that? You know, it's one thing when they're filling a gap that was 15% of the property sector. Can they do it when it's 25, 35, 50, 60% of the property se- of what the property sector was? 
I'm not sure they can. I'm not sure they can do that. No, no. It, it just for me, I think highlights the real dilemmas that the Chinese economy has, and of course the um, Chinese stock markets are significantly down relative to the U.S. markets, which are very significantly up, thanks mostly to AI. So I mean, <laughs> wherever you look, there's a bit of chaos out there, really. Yeah, it's a, it's honestly it's a, it's a it's a bit of a mess, and I just. I think the thing is that there's so much just, you know, people just going around just trying to just furiously keep those plates spinning. Yes. You know, and, you know, and I, I just I just think in a, a lot of ways that it, it could all just fall in a heap. And although, I mean, I, I don't know, you know, I mean, you look at you look at China, you know, there's over $10 trillion worth of worth of household savings sitting there. You know, do those get do those get sort of deployed? You know, into into the economy if if needed, you know, and you you all get savings bonds or something in, in exchange. I mean, you know, it is a, it is a command economy after. Yeah, it is absolutely, and you know, I, I think my view is that these things have a habit of going on for a lot longer than than many people expect. So I, I don't expect to see a sort of a massive immediate crash, but it's the long term trends that are actually quite interesting. I'll say the same in the US as well, and even in Australia. So these things take time to to work out and um of course in the meantime um <laughs> ordinary people try and get by and just you know keep living day to day but uh, i guess we can uh, paint a bit of a broader picture as well and um you know i think there are lots of interesting questions to explore ahead so uh, guess what when we're back next time we'll be able to do a little bit of a, a, another deep dive and uh, <laughs> see how things are developing but always interesting yeah, no, I'm looking forward to it. And, you know, I mean, hopefully, hopefully, if you have got time, I can get my hands on that data and we can, you know, put something together for the viewers. Yeah, I'll um, try and look it out over the weekend and uh, send you some. I've got the information. I just need to, to extract it. So uh, thank you very much, Tarek. Look forward to that and uh, look for our next uh, conversation. And uh, meantime, I hope you get some sleep. <laughs> thanks, mate. <laughs> and thanks for watching, folks. Yeah, take care. Bye bye.